It's The Big Show with me, Alex Belfield, talking to my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars, and then people that I've been trying to get on for years and years and years, and Lord Sugar said, no, I'm not wasting my time, but finally you've given in. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm all right, thank you very much. Would you help me with this one? What do I call you, firstly, Lord Sugar? Uh, you got it. That's right, that's right. It's not bad, not bad. I, I've done a few interviews <laughs> with BBC over the last couple of days, and I've reported some of the other people to the compliance people for getting my name wrong. <laughs> what are they calling you then? Sir, well, they still it? call me Sir Alan and all oh. that stuff. It's quite, it's quite, look, I, I don't care what you call me. You can, you can call me Alan as far as I'm concerned. It's just, it's just that I'm not Sir Alan anymore. It's gone, I'm afraid to mm. say. It's actually, it is the, the correct title is Lord Sugar. What a life you've had. I mean, I haven't seen the book because it's not out yet and I'm not meant to see it and all that, but I've read tons and tons of extracts and done a load of research on you. Um, and you really are the American dream, but from England, aren't you really? I mean, it started so um, modestly and it's ended up big time. Congratulations on that. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that was recognised uh, in the 80s by Margaret Thatcher, for example. I was the blue-eyed boy of the city then uh, when I first floated my company in 1981 because, as you quite rightly say, I started from nothing, uh, really, with £100 in the minivan. That is all true. And there's no, no reason on this God's earth why someone else can't do it in this day and age either. Have you thought how you go from being just a humble kid living a normal life to being a multimillionaire? Because, I mean, your path is so extraordinary and your success is so massive. Do you think you were born to greatness or is it just down to damn hard work? <laughs> Well, I don't know about born to greatness. You started quoting Shakespeare. Then, to be <laughs> um, I think the, th the thing is, is that uh, an entrepreneur, uh, and uh, as I've always said, is someone that it has something which is inbuilt inside them. Yeah. Uh, you either are one or you're not and it's not something that with respect you can be taught mm. uh, it needs to be prized out of you and I've always uh, um, kind of used a comparison of say a, a concert pianist for example now if you if you, if you lock me in a room for a, for a year with a piano teacher I guess at the end of the year I would could come out and you know, do you a quick rendition to roll out the barrel, right? Yes. Would I ever be a great concert pianist in the Royal Albert Hall? Never in a million years, because that person has a talent, okay? And in the same way, an entrepreneur has a talent inbred inside them. And an 11-year-old person that's going to end up becoming a concert pianist, if you know what I mean, didn't suddenly leap out of bed one morning and start playing some piano concerto in the E minor, whatever. Someone spotted it and then coaxed them and, and taught him and trained him or him or her uh, and made them the great person they are. And that's similar with the entre uh, an entrepreneur. You have to spot it. It has to be spotted and you have to be encouraged to actually then exploit it more. Your new autobiography is called What You See Is What You Get and it seems to me that your dad has really created the person you are today because he worked damn hard to make you the man you are today, really, didn't he? Well, he, he worked very, very hard, he, yeah. The, I mean, the family ethos was to work hard because there was no other, thing, no other way to get any money and uh, we never had any money. Uh, we lived in the council flats in, in Hackney and that was it. I mean, that, listen, nothing... You know, he'd done his best. He'd done his best. My mum and dad did their best. They had four children, of which I was the youngest. Uh, they did their best. I think the, the driving thing for me was to make sure that I was no, not going to struggle uh, like they had done um, over money. Money was not going to... You know, I, I wasn't going to struggle. I was going to become self-sufficient. What's your take on money isn't everything? It, it definitely it's not everything not everything at all but it does help doesn't it um it, it, you know get to a certain stage and you don't need any more um there are better th you know there are other things in life but of course you know you, everybody needs some money you need some money to you know put some food in your mouth for example and you know i sometimes admire some people particularly some of that i've employed over the years who are brilliant brilliant people that could have could have applied their mind a little bit differently and become richer uh that but are who are content with their life they've had that they wanted to earn their salary they were a, they went to work they came to work they did their job they've got their family life they've got their hobbies and they are content uh and and but but you know they needed money a certain amount of money uh in order to keep their family going 
It's an interesting point you make. Why now do you keep on keeping on when you've got enough money? What drives you to get out of bed in the morning? Because it isn't to make another million, is well, it? Well, that's, that's what we are. That's what we are. You know, you can ask the same of anybody, you know, of a football player. What, you know, why does he want to keep on playing? You know, I mean, he's got a problem, a football player, because physically uh, he can't, because he gets to the age of 35 or 40 and it's physical restraints to stop him doing it. But if they could, you ask any one of them, they would love to be out on the football pitch playing. And it's it's just this, you know. To me, bringing out a new product is is like scoring a goal. If you under, uh, you know, designing and engineering a new product and seeing it come to the market is it, 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 it's like scoring a goal, really. It's mm. uh, or winning or winning winning a league, and uh, you know. And then afterwards, whether it sells or not is important because it's a it, it's an ego thing. Whether it was a good idea, a good product. Uh, but really the amount of money that it makes or doesn't becomes irrelevant you're looking for the neck so it's just it's just that drive that you that the that, that will never go away is your greatest skill instinct judging people and products instantly and deciding my heart's in that or my heart's not in it well i think it's one of my skills i think it is i, I guess it is one of my greatest skills i'm not saying I'm, a, I'm i'm the world's best expert on it i don't have any exclusivity over judging people and having been a good judge of character or instinct because a lot of the other business people in this country man and woman um, men and women are, have got that instinct i mean you know so i don't have any exclusivity there uh, and some have even got it better than me maybe you know um but yeah I mean, it's part and parcel of your makeup. I want to talk about you as a child because I know you struggled at secondary school. Um, Anti-Semitism was a big problem for you for a while. Did that change you as a person? Did it make you a bit sceptical about people that they judge? Um, I, I, I think it's part of life's lessons. I think what I describe in my book is, is that an innocent child... Uh, brought into the world and sent to a primary school where we, uh, you know, all loved each other as kids. Well, to the to, uh, in the sense that it didn't matter who you were, whether you were an Asian, a black, uh, Jewish, or whatever. You just get on and you played and you and and you and you was as naughty and as spiteful uh, as you would normally be. There was no hint of racism at all, none whatsoever. So there you've got an innocent child if you like but sent to school at five up to the age of 11 and suddenly at the age of 11 when you leave when you leave and you go to another school and you suddenly start hearing people making racist chants about jews or blacks have you never heard it in your life before you've never ever heard it in your life but can you can imagine how traumatized one is when suddenly you start there's a, a reality of mm. My God, what, what 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 are they talking about? I remember going home and saying to my mum and dad, who kind of insulated me from it, didn't think it was necessary to coach me on what I was, what the world, what, what I was about to let myself in for, because we lived in a, you know, um, in flats, and not all in our flats we had, you know, non most majority non-Jewish people. Never ever came across uh, the problems at all, and so there you are. So it kind of hardens you up a little bit i was traumatized as a youngster but that lasted you know a few weeks until i realized this is what the world's like unfortunately there's ignorant people out there and you watch uh, some people that came from primary school with me who mm. were there who, who 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 were my best pals at primary school and here's a horrible thing innocent people like me and them best pals to sit together at primary school get to secondary school because we both went on to the same secondary school and they changed and they blew me out mm. uh, because they were they were poisoned by the minds of others unbelievable how are you with people now and trusting them because obviously you run a business and you've got to have people within it that you trust uh, with your money um, are you guarded as a person no, I think I think that experience, you know, over the years has, has, has aided me in assessing uh, professional people. Uh, and you know, in companies, you have systems and thing. You don't trust all your all your money to one individual. You know, you have systems in companies where uh, where, where there is a kind of a, a structure uh, as to how money or uh, expenditure is made. So I think that is kind of um, uh, really not an issue there. And then, you know, it's just experience as to whether you... Uh, and also, uh, yeah, experience of having people working with you uh, for a while and giving new people an opportunity to settle in and then you can kind of get an understanding of their nature and their culture. And that's when you know to entrust in them a little bit more. 
In terms of your starting off as a businessman, I mean, it was quite humble. I mean, you've done a million jobs over the years. W- what is the deal you're most proud of? Because it doesn't have to necessarily be for 10 million, does it? Exactly. No, you're quite right. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there are there, there, there's kind of milestones in your life, isn't there, really? And, uh, you know, I, I guess if you go back and you follow me through the book there and you see that I, I um, had two or three jobs in the electronics business and then ventured out very boldly um you know to go on my own yeah and i guess you know i still see it today that very very first sale that i made uh most probably for about four quid or something like that or six quid for six car aerials to mr p w thaxton in east (laughs) india dock road that was the first trade sale i made as amstrad to a trade customer and that 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 was and then you know Go and move on, move on um, uh, I don't know, 20 years from there uh, to 1987, say. And, you know, I'm, I'm selling 100 million pounds of goods to, to, to Dixon's, you, you know what I mean? So is that a great achievement? You know, of course it was. Maybe the, the first time I brought an, uh, a, a, a computer out and um, when I saw it, you know, uh, you, you, you develop the computer, you think it's good, you know it's good, your people tell you it's good, we're all enthusiastic about it, but you know who makes the decision as whether it's good or not? Mm. It's the public. And so when you stick it in the shops and then bingo, suddenly they start calling you up and say, send some more of this stuff down here, then you've made it, you, you've hit it, you know. So there's lots of those kinds of um, uh, moments but they don't necessarily have to you quite rightly said doesn't have to be the biggest deal that you've done yeah and what about being a star now Lord Sugar because of course everybody knows you because of The Apprentice almost your business life is irrelevant we like you for the man who says you're fired um, <laughs> do, you, do you see that as, as a compliment that we know you for that or do you wish we knew more about your business dealings well I mean the thing is the book I'll give the opportunity of knowing more about me I mean I have I'm realistic okay um, I was known in the city in the 80s as this 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 this, this um, rags to riches story uh margaret thatcher's you know kind of um uh dream really uh, of what she wanted um and um then of course i got involved in football and i was known there uh so it, it, this kind of fame or whatever word you want to call it is not exactly new to me uh, although to be perfectly blunt, it is big. Of course, it's much bigger. And I can understand why the general public at large, uh, if you stopped them in the street, said, Alan Sugar, this old apprentice, right? Uh, if you pushed them a little bit more and said, is there anything else you know about him? They'd say, well, football. And if you pushed them even harder, they'd say, oh, he's the bloke who brought, who brought computer to the masses, yeah? Mm. Um, so it's not new. It's not, it, it's not new to me. And um, so it doesn't come as a, as a bit of a shock. But it is... They're very, it's very pleasant to be recognised by the youngsters, uh, in particular, um, for the you know the awareness that the the show has has made of business and got them inspired. And that's what I enjoy about it. Is it fun? I I, I would only do it if it's fun, uh, and I would only do it if it is if it's bringing results and inspiring young people. The day that don't happen is the day you don't see me anymore. What about the comparisons to you and Donald Trump? Because, of course, he's your compadre the other side of the Atlantic who does The Apprentice. Are you similar as people or can you be totally different but equally as successful? Well, I, look, I don't know Donald Trump at all. I've spoke to him once for a very short period of time over a telephone. So it would be completely unwise of me to, uh, you know, form any opinions from that. And I've learned in life you do not... Uh, you, you do not form opinions by listening to others. Right. So, you know, you form your own opinions. Look, Donald Trump was the first one to do this in America. Uh, it was the format uh, was, was, was invented in America. The American market, as we know, culturally, is completely different uh, to United Kingdom. And, uh, you know, he does and did a good job on The Apprentice there. Um, they sent his program over here to England. They put it on BBC Two. It didn't go down too well, I think it's fair to say. My one, uh, because I am adapted to the English culture and the English way of life, has been a success. Mm. So you see both people, very successful, doing the same thing, but in a different marketplace. So.
Well, I find his hair so distracting. That's the problem with the American version, isn't it? Um, you're in a league of finance that basically you don't have to worry about the first class ticket. You can buy the plane. You don't worry about staying in a five star hotel. You can buy the hotel. If we were to go out and have fun, what would make you happy? What would be a good day out for me and you? Well, I'll go on my bike somewhere, you know, and uh, get out in the countryside on a nice ride on a day which is not too hot, not too or uh, not raining. Um, you know, find new routes there. I'll take my plane up, a little plane up for a fly and, uh, you know, go and visit somewhere in France or something like that. I mean, that's the type of thing that I do. I'd, I'd watch and I'd come home and watch some, you know, TV program that, 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 um, that uh, you know, I'm interested in, uh, or go to a football game. I mean, I'm I'm a very simple fellow, you know. <laughs> and if we were to have a dinner together, what's your favourite bite to eat? Oh, well, I've always loved Italian food. I guess I suppose it is the best. It is really, a, on, well, as far as I'm concerned, the Italian food is the best. I don't go for all this nouveau cuisine stuff and mm. all that Gordon Gordon's uh, Gordon Ramsay stuff with all these twigs <laughs> sticking up on the plate and. <laughs> pretty pictures yeah, and, a plate uh, of leaves as you uh, did <laughs> or whatever it is and some lump of fish which has still got this glistening skin on it oh it, it puts me off quite frankly do you still uh, get upset when you go into a restaurant and you charge 20 quid for a meal that's only worth five pounds regardless of how rich you are does that still bother you well i think it doesn't matter how rich you are you don't like no one likes being ripped off okay and so you won't find me going to places where i'm going to lead with my chin and get ripped off i, I just won't go there not because uh, i'm stingy it's just that i just will not have it i mean uh, you know i don't no one should no one should be stand it should, it should be ripped off and i don't like some of these so-called high class restaurants that 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 make it hard to get in and play this game oh sorry you can't book uh, we're booked for 3 months I mean, that's such a lot of nonsense that is these days that that, that old game is uh, is really it, it's wore itself out but you get ordinary people that come from say the provinces or come down to london who have heard about certain restaurants and mm. they and they look forward to it for the whole of the year and they've actually got a reservation for it and they're going to go in there and they're prepared to spend two or three hundred pounds and quite frankly uh, they're wasting their money because it is not that great uh, if you know what I mean Very finally before we go politically we've got a new coalition we've not had that before is this a good place to be? Well, I, I, th I would say watch this space because I can't see this coalition uh, lasting too long. I think uh, I think if Gordon Brown and David Cameron, if you got them in a room on their own or if their wives were laying next to them in bed at night and asked them, would you have done live TV interviews again? Both of them would have said no, mm. because I think the live TV interview is what caused the mess that we're in at the moment. We have a coalition government where where the Liberal Party were given uh, airtime in the middle of a live television broadcast. They started making promises that they they had no intention of fulfilling because they thought they never weren't going to get in, and then and and they confused everybody so that you know uh, it, we didn't have a majority one way or the other, Labour or Conservative, and now. Uh, Clegg and people like Cable, uh, I don't know what's hit them. They're like late Orient playing in the Champions League. I mean, they're, you know, <laughs> they found themselves sitting there and they're, oh, blimey, I, we did say that. Oh, yeah, we did say this, but we didn't mean it, actually. We just, it's just a spoiling tactic, actually. Um, you know, we didn't really mean it. So I'll tell you, they've got to sort themselves mm -hmm. out. Look, the recession, I think, you know, people get themselves out of recession. Um, they've got to realise that there's no free lunch culture out there and once they've overcome that and get get their heads down get back working again and um w w you won't know when you're out of recession you only know you're in a recession when you don't know you're in a boom you never know you're in a boom you only know when you was in a boom when you look back and say oh blimey that was good look where we are today so I think you have to work your way out of it. Lord Sugar, has this been OK, me asking you questions? I mean, you're a very private man. Obviously, you've written the book, so you're prepared to talk about it. Would you rather not talk? Sorry? Would you rather not have to do this? I mean, in, in, a, in your dream world, is it OK talking about you? Because you, you are a private man, aren't you? Well, relatively private, but I'm, I, I do, I do, I talk all day long. I go around the country and talk to people in schools. I talk to 
business people. I host Q and A's all uh, every single week of the year. Uh, that's what I do to try and inspire people. So mm. I've got a problem with people asking me questions. Have I done all right? I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want you slagging you, me off to you've compliance done all, you've or anything. Done all right. I'll, I'll make sure that you're not you're <laughs> not, not reported <laughs> you're not reported to the BBC <laughs> compliance unit. Uh, Apprentice starts tonight. Then is it going to be a good one? Very good. Uh, like all products, you know, um, the more, the longer you make them, the more experience you have in making them, the better they get. And I think you're, you're going to see this as the, the best series so far. It's been a great honour for me and a thrill as well. Lord Sugar's new book is out. It's called What You See Is What You Get. Uh, it's released £20. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the programme. Really appreciate it. OK.